Thank you so much for joining us here at ODSC Virtual Conference. Uh, we hope you enjoyed streaming all sorts of talks, trainings, workshops on the second day of ODSC. Uh, please don't forget to fill a small session survey you would have received in the emails for the sessions you attended. It's going to help us shape our future program and the content. Uh, this evening here in the East Coast of US, I would like to introduce our keynote, Jake Torve, uh, a pioneer for the Data for Good movement. Jake is an expert in the field of data and technology. Uh, as the founder and executive director of DataKind, a global nonprofit dedicated to using data science and AI in the service of humanity, he has worked alongside the nonprofit community to drive social change with the power of data science since 2011. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Jake. All right, hey everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Tushar, for the intro and for all the ODSC uh, organizers for having me. It's a huge honor to be here and kudos to y'all for turning this conference virtual last minute. I know that is no easy feat. Uh, also, I wanna thank everyone for coming um, and really also send out kind of well wishes and hopes for everyone out there. We're dealing with pretty unprecedented times right now and I just wanna wish everyone well uh, and hope that folks uh, even who've been affected by the, the pandemic are, are hanging in there. So thoughts to everyone who's, who's listening. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about creating systems change approach for data science AI. As Tushar was saying, uh, if you know me or data kind, we focus a lot on using data science for good, for creating a more socially prosperous world. And we've been thinking lately about how to take that to the next level and start tackling systemic challenges. And so I wanted to share some early results with the ODSC community and get some feedback. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about today. By way of a little bit of introduction, wanna, uh, for those of you who don't know data kind or myself, uh, I'll give a quick background of how we got to where we are today. Like many of you, uh, I was thrilled in 2010 to see the digitization going on in the world. You know, we were strapping iPhones on ourselves, there were satellites in the world, and I just thought, oh my goodness, all of the data techniques that we've been using in labs or in companies can be brought to the greater world. We could learn more about our society and our communities and help the world in ways we couldn't ever before. Incredibly exciting times. Now, you fast forward, you know, 10 years, a lot of the changes we've made have been uh, kind of disappointing, frankly. Um, you know, we've been helping more comfortable lives get a little more comfortable, like making sure that we never forget how to make pancakes or using the most advanced robotics to help us buy other robots. And, you know, it'd be kind of funny in its frivolity if it weren't for the fact that there's also a big conversation about the downsides of the work going on. Everyone is, of course, familiar with the ways that we hear every day about data science unraveling democratic norms, or entrenching systemic inequities and racist outcomes even worse, committing human rights violations. Yeah, this is serious stuff. And well, really, you know, made us scratch our heads and say, how is it that for this incredibly powerful technology, we have such potentially bad outcomes, uh, just between consumer goods and uh, potential, you know, negative outcomes for the world. And especially at a time when there are so many places that we could be using data science and machine learning for good. Here we are in the middle of a global pandemic. The question should be on everyone's mind. How could the same algorithms that we use to boost profits instead be used to boost impact on redistributing uh, personal protective equipment or helping fight COVID? And you know, one of the challenges that we know exist in the world is that so many of these organizations that are on the front lines of social change do have data, but they barely have anyone to help them look at it or understand it. They don't have Google as engineering teams. They can't afford that. And so a lot of the social good that machine learning could be doing just is, doesn't it occur? And so we wondered, you know, is there a better way? Could we live in a different future? And, and the answer I believe very strongly is yes. That's why we found a data kind. A data kind is a nonprofit dedicated to using data science and machine learning in the service of humanity. Well, we want to see a world where for any problem that stands in the way between us and social prosperity, where machine learning could help, it gets done. It gets used ethically and responsibly. And one of the ways that we work on that is we bring together frontline change organizations nonprofits, governments, and we bring them together with technologists who are volunteering from industry or academia to co-create innovative solutions. Say, how could we use data science to really drive social impact? And the great thing is, of course, it's a way for data scientists to have social impact. It's a way for social organizations to maximize their impact. And then, of course, everyone else just gets to live in a better world. I'll show you an example of what that looks like, but I realized I have to do a quick terminology check. So, look, I studied computer science in a track called intelligent systems, which then become called AI. Uh, I studied statistics, but did machine learning. Uh, my first jobs were AI engineer and the data scientist. So I recognized the nuance in a lot of these terms. 
But for today, I'm going to commit a total field foul and just use them all as synonyms. Synonyms for computers using data to do stuff faster and cheaper. Very happy to have the debate about the nuances between data science or AI. Catch me offline, but hopefully for today, you could just go with me and say, fine, computers and data making stuff faster and cheaper. We can call that any of the terms for, for right now. So with that, I'll talk about an example of computers using data to do stuff faster and cheaper for social impact. So there's a project that uh, one of the data kind teams did with a group called Molten Miguel Water District. Now, their whole job is to get water to folks in Southern California, and there's a lot of droughts in that region. So they have a tough job. And one of the problems they face is they have to predict how much water demand there's going to be. And if they're wrong, if they underestimate how much water they need, they have almost no recourse except to take a dump truck, drive it to another reservoir, fill it with a hose, and bring it back. Now, not only do people not get water, in that time, it's a huge waste of energy. It's incredibly expensive. So it's really a high cost problem. And so they wondered, you know, is there a better way? Could we predict more accurately what people want? And so we teamed them up with a number of volunteers, including the chief data scientist at Netflix of all places. Um, and together they used data from the water district and external data to build a predictive model to understand block by block, how much do we, water do we predict there's gonna be? Apologies for the silence in the background. Uh, I was gonna say, they're trying to predict, I'm just trying to talk over it, uh, how much water would, would be needed. And as a result of this tool and the water district using it, uh, they actually not only got fewer water disruptions that year, they saved $25 million, which is a huge amount of money that these organizations could be using to saving lives or improving water access in other ways. So to me, that's a great example of what can happen when a social organization has data scientists on team, on, on the staff or working on a project. And in the last eight years that data has been around, we've done over 300 of these projects. There are 30,000 folks around the world who signed up as data kind volunteers. And we have uh, local hubs, chapters within cities in DC, San Francisco, Bangalore, UK, Singapore, uh, that also carry this work on all around the world. And I will just note one thing I really love about these projects is not only do they produce a good data science outcome for the organization, they also help people understand what data science can do. So we've seen lots of organizations then go on to hire data scientists or be able to justify the cost of a data scientist. And so uh, we feel very happy that these projects are just the beginning of hopefully a longer journey of getting the social sector more data enabled. And as great as I, you know, I love data kind and work at data kind, uh, you know, it'd be remiss not to mention that there's lots of other groups out there that also are focused on data for good. Data Science for Social Good, for example, or Driven Data uh, have opportunities for data scientists to help on social impact problems. There are nonprofits that do have data teams. Medic Mobile and Ushahidi, for example, are tech-based nonprofits that help the world. And the corporations, of course, are getting into the mix too. Microsoft is a very healthy AI for good program that gets technologists to building AI solutions for social good. So I feel like it's never been a better time to be a technologist who cares about doing social impact because there's so many ways to get involved. But there is a catch. Uh, the catch for me is that DataKind's mission isn't to do a bunch of volunteer projects. Our mission isn't even to do the most volunteer projects. No, our mission is to live in a world where data science and machine learning is used to tackle every challenge where it can to bring about social prosperity. And the challenge is, as great as these individual projects are, I don't believe that we're gonna get to solving big systems level problems just on the backs of more volunteer projects. You know, how could it could be 50, 100, even 1,000 more projects, probably wouldn't get us closer to like ending famine, right? And those are the pro kind of problems we're facing in the world. So the question we've been thinking about a lot of data kind is, how might we create data science solutions that go beyond the individual project? How could you have systems level impact? So for example, not just helping Molten, Molten Miguel Water District get water to the folks in Southern California, what if you try to think bigger and say, well, how could we get better water access to everyone in the US, maybe the world or in similar water districts? That's all of a sudden a much bigger question. And to think about what it might take to do that, let me just illustrate what I see as the differences in building solutions in the for-profit space versus a systems level approach to the social impact space. So let's say you work at Netflix. I love Netflix, I, I subscribe, I, it's a great program. Uh, and let's just say you, you've been given the task to improve the movie recommendation algorithm, okay? Straight ahead. If you're an engineer, you're gonna use Netflix's user data, you might use data outside, but you've got your data right there in-house, you've got great data engineers, you've got a great data engineering team all around you, so you can build lots of really cool algorithms. And at the end of the day, you're gonna know you're successful if people keep paying Netflix money. 
I don't say that to be cynical. I just think as a straight ahead fact, like Netflix's goal is to make a better service so people keep paying for it. That's one of the biggest indicators of whether it's doing well. It not its, its goal is not, however, to build the best movie recommendation algorithm for every platform, like for Hulu and Amazon. And it's not really out there to make sure that you have like, you know, racially equitable choices or that you're getting a diverse set of programming. In fact, to the contrary, it's probably to show you the stuff you most like no matter what. Uh, and that's, again, that's fine. But as we move into the social sector, you see it's a sort of different problem we're trying to tackle. And so let's just take the case of where if we're trying to use AI built algorithm to reduce the time it takes to, to detect disease outbreaks, something very you know, prescient given the time we're living in now. Well, the first thing you'd notice if you're trying to tackle that problem as a data scientist, the first thing you notice, there's no single organization that owns that problem. Right? Hospitals may be participating in that by looking at patient data that's coming in to look at anomalies. Clinics might be helping on the front lines. Governments might be looking across national statistics to understand which areas are at risk of outbreak. There's a huge number of actors uh, working in the space. And so you already have to shift your mind from working with one group to thinking, how would we work with multiple groups? And how do we organize how they all work together? The second thing I think is most unique uh, is that each of these groups has their own data sets. And I, I really actually would love help if people can think of another profession besides ours where we can build something for someone or be asked to build something, but we have to use their resources to do it. Like think how bonkers it would be if you were a con you know, construction worker and someone said, build me a deck. And you go, I know how to build a deck. It could fit in your house like this, blah, blah, blah. And then they go, oh, yeah, you have to use the wood in my shed. Oh, God, four pieces of like you know, gnarled wood. I, I can't build you a deck. But weirdly, that's our job, right? Like we have to build data science solutions for others. We have to use their data. So if you're trying to build this AI, uh, you know, tool or this algorithm to detect disease outbreaks, you'd have to understand, you know, what all the hospitals have slightly different patient data, all the clinics have different data. How do you even know all the data that's out there to use? Then as I mentioned, you need technologists, which there aren't many of in the social sector. If you're successful, you have to find a way to make money from this thing. We're not going to talk about that today. But then importantly on that success note, it's usually not enough to solve the engineering problem. The expectation is also you can try to do no harm. So you'd have to ask, you know, what, what are the harms of a false positive for the outbreak or false negative? What if you miss one? Is that okay? And then of course there's like nuance. Um, you know, what if it turns out that you can all, this thing only really works in wealthy areas because those hospitals can collect enough data for this thing to work. Is that okay? It's certainly not equitable, but you know, is that acceptable within the design? So that's, uh, I think actually a fundamentally different process for designing these things that we may actually face in other fields. Again, I'm, I'm a nerd about this, but new to it. So I do welcome recommendations if folks see analogs in other spaces. So when you think back at this, it could be kind of defeating. Oh my God. I mean, to, to try to try to like tackle this thing like that, it's a huge thorny problem. I just want to like get a data set and start hacking with the heck. The good news is when you look at this kind of map, one thing that becomes clear to me when I look at it is there, one way to, to make progress in this problem is with lots and lots of people. And the good news is DataKind is a network of lots and lots of people. Um, even if there's not a clean way to design these solutions, we certainly know we'd probably need lots of folks to go to each hospital, understand the data that's there, build some prototypes. And in a way, that's something we might be able to do with our network and with other communities. Uh, you can think about it like doing an innovation challenge or like an X prize, where lots of teams are working to solve a problem, and in that case, they're competing. But here we might be able to staff lots of those teams and then have them collaborate. And again, that could be with data kinders or others abroad. So that's how we've been thinking about changing our approach. And practically, it doesn't look all that different from what we've already done. We already do lots of projects in different issue areas, say in agriculture, medicine, or microfinance. The approach here would simply to be very strategic about building portfolios of projects where we focus on an issue area and look at how our projects could learn the most about what prototypes are useful, what data sets are needed, et cetera. And we're calling this impact practices. And so data kind of be focusing on across its network organizing. How are these projects all learning from each other and impact practices? The first two areas that we're focused on are community health workers and economic resilience. So community health workers is, is a system in areas that have low uh, health infrastructure where people will actually go in their own communities and deliver health care, be that checkups or delivering vaccines so that you can get good health outcomes even without a hospital being nearby. And a lot of these uh, folks are actually becoming digitized. They're digital systems that they're using. Um, so the question now is, what data science solutions might help create better health outcomes across the board? You know, what if every health worker could predict who needs uh, a, a visit right away? Well, how much more good could you do there? With economic resilience, we're focused on keeping folks above the poverty line. 
we know certainly in the US and other places in the world, lots of folks are above the poverty line, but you're only one issue away from going back under. Uh, you could miss a, a, a rent payment, you could have to go to the hospital and miss childcare. So we're also thinking about how to strengthen social systems with data science and machine learning uh, so that, that folks can actually stay above that line. Well, I want to take a quick note because one thing I want to note is like it could be, you know, could come off as tone deaf to say, yeah, we're focused on these issues without addressing the, the elephant in the room, which is of course COVID-19. Um, when the global pandemic broke, the very first thing that we talked about in our community was what would the data science, the data kind of data science community be able to contribute? And while there are lots of specific COVID-19 uh, projects that we're seeing start to develop, uh, we have a pretty strong stance that just kind of hacking in this moment can do a lot more harm than good. We actually have a blog post up on our site if you want to read more about our thoughts. But what did be seen clear was that these issue areas that existed before COVID and will exist after are certainly going to be hit by it pretty hard. Frontline health workers are going to need a lot of help and, and technology could help in certain ways. And as folks are feeling the fallout from the virus and, and lockdowns, economic resilience is going to be really critical. So we're really pivoting and focusing our efforts with our partners here and in, uh, in these two impact practices. Uh, we will have some other COVID related work, but this is really going to be where we think we can have the biggest uh, impact. So happy to talk more about that later, but wanted to make sure that that was, uh, uh, yeah, that was heard. So let me give you just a quick example, some early results, and then I will uh, take off, turn around the questions here. So look, focusing on the community health worker front, one of the cross-sector challenges we saw is that a lot of organizations are becoming digital, but they have all of this paper data that they have been using for years. And if you just start from when the digital data turns on, you're going to use 10 years of data about health statistics that is critical for potentially good health outcomes. So we've been working with one group, Riders for Health, uh, and Riders for Health, as you can tell, uses motorcycles to deliver vaccines where there are not good infrastructure, good roads, or going to help folks out uh, at home to home. Um, and they do have digital tech on them to record the data, but it's often easier to just fill out a form. So you end up with a ton of paper forms um, that it can often take weeks, if not months, to actually digitize because you have to copy them over and transport them to an office. And so all that data is either, if it even gets into the digital system, it takes forever. So a team of volunteers, um, actually working from uh, across uh, IDEO and IBM, some other great organizations have been working with this team to uh, do handwritten recognition. Of course, anyone who's done an intro to machine learning course has probably had to do with a handwriting recognition or digit recognition project. Now uh, they're extending that uh, with some off-the-shelf tools and some tweaks to help digitize this data. And the great thing is, this is now taking that process from weeks, if not months, down to hours. So just think about all that data that they're able to bring uh, in-house and actually digitize. That means that uh, across the board, that not just Rogers for Health, but other organizations that we see have the same problem might be able to use this tool. Another quick one comes from the group Medic Mobile. Uh, Medic Mobile has a digital platform where community health workers can input data about the homes that they're seeing. And this is great. So great, in fact, that certain countries, their governments are saying, hey, we should actually just adopt this digital system wholesale for our like health infrastructure. The problem is that data has to be super reliable for that to happen. And of course, right now you've got so many people in the system, there could be little errors, right? Like you show two pregnancies each day and then you see 22. Is that because there's suddenly a lot more pregnancies or did somebody just accidentally type a second two? So some data validation will help with that, but teams have been, volunteers have been working on analyzing the flows of data across this platform and many others to see if we can build a kind of common system for data quality, because if we could, if that were possible and it could actually adapt across many of these digital platforms, you might be able to see like large national, if not continental scale adoption. And that would be huge for more efficient health outcomes. So those are just two quick examples. There's more you can read about on our site. Um, but that's what we hope to demonstrate is to say, we can, by working with multiple organizations with similar challenges, we might be able to surface those problems that could extend to sector wide scale. So I know I'm gonna take off, I wanna make room for questions here. I will just leave you all with kind of like three really quick learning lessons if uh, if you end up going down this route. Uh, it may be enough that you're like, hey, cool, data for good projects, those are neat, maybe I'll volunteer. But if you're a system change nerd like me, here are like three tips from, uh, that, uh, based on what we've already seen. The first I'd say is no map, no app. I would like to have a, I wanted that to be pithy, but I'm really open to alternative uh, phrasing. But basically the idea here is um, if you're not mapping the system that you're trying to improve, it, you shouldn't even be building a data science solution. Uh, it, you, at the end of the day, as data scientists, we're like optimizing a system, right? We don't live in a vacuum. And so we should always be asking, even with one organization, 
what a change do we hope to affect? How are we actually influencing the outcome? Well, when you're talking about a systems level problem, whew, that is magnified. You have multiple organizations and they've got tons of problems that are non-technical, right? You might have two hospital directors who just don't like each other. So the politics are a problem. You gotta be clear-eyed about that kind of work. Otherwise, you might be building solutions that don't, that aren't gonna matter because they're never gonna get past those gates. So I'd say, think about systems mapping. And if you need a primer, if not a Bible on it, the Omidyar Network Systems Change Workbook is free online. It's incredible. I totally recommend following that. Second is, we always say at DataKind, start with the problem, not the data. Everyone in this room probably says that. And I think number one, no map, no app is pretty similar to that. But the one thing I'd say is that if you start working with multiple organizations or look at systems change solutions, leave space for the data to offer creativity. You might be asked by multiple hospitals to figure out how to do triaging of patients, but it might be that with all of those hospitals data, you could do that outbreak detector because as a whole, you might be able to see something you wouldn't see individually. So definitely be rooted in the problem, but leave space for that data creativity. I see 99% of data projects, people go, do I have enough data to solve the problem? Not, what related problems might I be able to solve? Last, most importantly, build with, not for. This is a quote from the civic tech space, meaning you can't build tech and like on others, right? And it may not be obvious. I'm this white dude sitting here in, in New York in my apartment um, talking about helping with frontline health in, in East Africa. What do I know about that, that space? Nothing, which is why I'm not on the project. I'm here to talk about it, but it's certainly not the work I'm doing. Uh, we really focus to try to get technologists, NGOs, and others who are working in the ecosystem together to not just advise, but actually design these solutions together, because that's the only way you're going to be able to account for all the cultural context, the way it's going to be in, you know, actually deployed, et cetera. And as a side note, I'd love to talk to folks about this afterwards. I think we actually have a real um, opportunity in the social good space if we can put the power of the out the control over the algorithms in the hands of the NGOs or the constituents, we may actually be able to reach a level of like ethical AI that is beyond what I think we, we could see in other spaces. Um, in other words, if constituents could actually say, you know, this algorithm doesn't work for me, let's not use it. That's a that's a level of, of power that frankly we don't have in the kind of uh, the world today. I can't change how Facebook organizes my feed very well, but I digress. I'll leave that there for anyone who thinks that's interesting. But I think these are things you can follow on with. And I'll just emphasize, I always try to end with lessons like this that have frankly not much to do with data science, but really human-centered design principles. And I think that's really important because if you're really trying to be a data scientist making impact, you know, it's great to get your, your tech skills up, but if you want to move from being a hacker to making social change, it's these design tools that are just going to make a world of difference. So really emphasize those. And if you have more questions, you can certainly come to ask me or anyone at DataCon. To that end, if you want to be involved with DataKind, I would say, hey, uh, look, come follow us at datakind.org uh, or find us on our social media channels. Uh, we're going to be announcing other opportunities to be involved with our impact practices and any COVID response. And in the meantime, if you are interested in getting involved with COVID-19 response, there are two great sites you can start with. Other presenters may have mentioned these, but usdigitalresponse.org is a way you can help with governments in the U.S. CoronavirusTechHandbook.com is a compendium of all things tech from how to work with your remote team to uh, how to actually get involved in volunteer efforts. And no matter what, whether you're working at the systems change level or individual level or just working in your own job right now, trying to stay sane, the thing I want to say is the world needs y'all more than ever. Uh, we're facing a lot of challenges out there in the social change space from climate change to pandemics to the rise of autocracy. And look, data science isn't going to be the end all be all for those things. There's lots of problems that have nothing to do with technology. But where there is a need for data science and machine learning, and there are plenty, really is going to be critical that folks who are thoughtful and really understand those tools are involved. And that's everyone in this virtual room. That's everyone in the ODSC community. So whether this is the beginning, middle, or any part of your data for good journey, I hope you continue on it. You know that there's a whole community behind you. So we well, thank you all for that. And I look forward to seeing you all on the front lines. Thanks for your time. So, Tushar, I'm turning. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Jane. I think we have uh, four more minutes. Uh, so, attendees, please welcome to you know send your questions in the question box box right uh, on the right side of your panel. Uh, we have one question from Vankta. Uh, how can a nonprofit industry use a data science volunteer network? Uh, and how can I register to ask help from DataKind? 
It's a great question. So very practically on datakind.org slash get involved, there is a sign up form where you can register your interest or you can email contact at datakind.org. One thing I'll also note though for nonprofits that are thinking about taking advantage of Datakind or any other volunteer network, one of the most helpful things you can do to advance is um, not try to name your data problem. A lot of folks think, well, I have a data problem for them, but that can be difficult. So I think one of the best things to do is instead say, what are your problems generally? It's the hardest thing to do in tackling your work because then a data scientist on any of those teams can help figure out where data science could help. Um, but I would say that that's that is a very useful first step you can do even before you contact the volunteer network. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Yep, I have one more question from Ben. Uh, so, so the point is last time I checked, DataKind seemed very local oriented with its, with its organizational structure, and it was really hard to get involved with volunteering for data science or social good projects without actually physically being in a city that DataKind was in. Uh, has that changed? Uh, is there a way I can get involved remotely at a distance? Super great question, Ben. Uh, so I will say that, first off, thank you for being involved. And my apologies to anyone who's tried to be involved and has found it difficult. Uh, like many volunteer organizations, we often have more demand than we can place. So apologies, we just appreciate everyone's patience. We're always trying to get folks on as quickly as possible. Uh, the double, you know, kind of silver lining of COVID is that actually we're completely virtual now. And while we've been trying to involve folks from outside the chapter cities, uh, now it's really, truly uh, fairly global. Um, there are also, for our impact practice work or the projects there, um, we do do kind of global volunteer calls and people have joined from all over the world. So yes, please be involved. You know, let us know if it's not as easy as you want to be, it's how we get better. But, um, but I would say, yeah, now more than ever, it is open to people wherever you can contribute your time. So thank you, Ben, and I hope very much that we can work with you. Thank you very much, Jake, for such an interesting talk uh, and answering all the questions. Uh, but to send these guys uh, to join the next keynote, which starts in the next five to seven minutes, uh, please follow the link in the auditorium section of your uh, ODSC live panel, uh, and we'll see you there. Thank you, Jake, again. Thank you. I'm Jake at datakind.org if you have any questions I didn't get to. Thanks, everybody. Bye.